<laughs> Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I am Roger Killen, the organizer. This talk is brought to you by Envision Coworking, where you'll enjoy a beautiful space and a beautiful community with beautiful people. Our speaker is John Morrison. John understands how tough it is to get noticed in a noisy world. He is a champion of the power of story to capture attention and spread ideas. John is the lead consultant at Get Clear Consulting, a marketing firm de devoted to empowering the best businesses with the best tools that they need to grow. John lives in Abbotsford, British Columbia, with his wife and three daughters. Vancouver Business Network members and most welcome guests, I invite you now to put your hands together and give John Morrison the VBN welcome that he deserves. Is that the right way? There we go. That is it. Great. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Great to see you again. I'm going to talk about marketing. And I know marketing is one of those things that is really simple when you think about it. Right? Like as entrepreneurs or business leaders, you've got an idea usually started because you saw some problems, something that you could fix in the world. And you said, I think we can figure out a way to solve this, to make the world a little better. And so you created a product or a service or a course or some sort of offering that was going to solve the problem. And then when it became your turn to actually talk about it, you found out it was actually a little more difficult than just the simple idea of just making it available, right? You thought if I could just make this available, the whole world will accept it because it's that obvious that people need it and it's there. And then all of a sudden you tried to tell people about it. And sometimes you got nervous and you stumbled and it wasn't that clear. Or maybe they were distracted. Or maybe you heard about ways to, to communicate with people online. And you realized that everyone else was figuring out how to talk to people online. So you thought of a new tool like LinkedIn or Google or Google Ads or Facebook, Twitter. I mean, all kinds of different ideas. Uh, platforms, areas that you could talk about what you do. And you found out that more and more, these places are very crowded. Our world is very, very, very noisy. And the ironic thing is that we just went through, or we're probably in the still in it, one of the most amazing communication revolutions, far greater than even the printing press and the invention of the television combined. The internet is an amazing thing that we can connect with people across the world where before we would have never known them. I mean, if you're a grandparent, you know how cool this is, right? You get to FaceTime with your, with your grandkids wherever you're at. If you're a parent, you know that you, wherever you're traveling, you can talk to your kids. If you're doing business, you know that you can reach markets that you would never have been able to do it before. So we have all these amazing tools and great technology, and yet it's, it's incredibly difficult. Marketing is very simple, but when we actually try to do it, it's incredibly difficult. Kind of reminds me of parenting, actually. You know, before you have kids, uh, everybody wants to give you some advice about what it's like to have kids and how different your life is going to be, right? You see a pregnant woman, what do you want to do? Congratulate them and then give them some advice. And then you have the kids and then you realize every bit of advice is welcome. <laughs> because as one friend told me, he heard it somewhere too, parenting is the act of taking simple things and making them incredibly difficult. I'll say it again. Parenting is the act of taking simple things and making them incredibly difficult. Uh, think of like eating. My wife and I, when we just got married, we would eat stuff and we would just put it in front of us and we would just put it in our mouths. And when we were done, we'd clean it all up. And it was like, just very simple. Take food, put it in your mouth. Now we have three kids under five. Eating is a spectacle. Sometimes I think we should charge, my, my entrepreneur side gets, kicks in. I'm like, we should charge admission for this. It's a show. We got stuff flying around. It's interactive. It's funny. There's the fighting going on. It's like a reality TV show, every single meal. But all we got to do is get the food on the plate into the mouth. It's very simple, but in, th in practice, very difficult. Leaving the house used to be something that my wife and I used to do very simply. Right? We'd look at each other like, would you like to leave the house? And we'd say, yes, that would be a good idea. Let's leave the house. Put on our jackets, put on our shoes, and we'd leave the house. Now we have kids. That simple process has become a huge endeavor. In fact, sometimes taking up to 25 minutes. We got to get the shoes on the one kid, then the shoes on the second kid, the shoes on the third kid, grab the coats, go back to the first, realize they've taken their shoes off, put the shoes back on, put the coat on, go back, put the shoes on again, put the coat on. 
Leaving the house is incredibly difficult, but it's very simple. You want one more? Okay, bedtime. Uh, used to be a very simple thing. I'd look at my wife, we'd be tired, we'd look at each other, would you like to go to bed? Yes, that'd be a good idea. Let's go to bed. And we would just lay in our beds and then fall asleep. It was done. These days, going to bed is like World War III every single night. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a routine that involves fighting with the bath, fighting with the shampoo in the bath, fighting with who gets out of the bath first, uh, what towel even we use, who gets to keep the towel, what jammies are on, which seasonally appropriate jammies get used, and on and on we go which, through which stories we read, uh, who says prayers first. I mean, there's just, it's, every night is this, just a battle. But sleeping is very simple. And then once we actually lay down, there's no guarantee that it's over, right? Uh, we have people wandering our house all at all hours of the night, right? It's just like zombies walking around all the time. I used to kiss my wife uh, good night. Now I just kiss her good luck because we never know <laughs> what's going to happen. You think something so simple like just laying down and going to sleep. No, it's not simple. Parenting does that. But marketing is the same, right? We want to take something simple like talk about what we do in a way that inspires people. And we find that we're in a very noisy world. If that frustrates you, I want to share with you a little bit about that because our noisy world makes it very difficult to get people's attention, especially the people that you want to reach, the people that we know you can help. That inside this room and whoever's watching it across the world right now, uh, there are some amazing ideas and products and courses that would transform lives, but getting their attention is so difficult. And that's incredibly frustrating for you if you're a business owner, isn't it? So this is why we struggle. There's three things that, that I think are causing this problem. The first one is that we've adapted to noise, right? We didn't always have so much noise. It's just that we do now. In fact, some people say we have over 3,000 marketing messages that we're hit with every single day. It comes from our phones, comes through the radio, comes through uh, media that we consume throughout the day. It comes in all kinds of shapes and forms, but we're getting hit with these messages all the time. And we've gotten good at tuning it out. Stuff that we're not interested in, we just say, you know what, this isn't for me. And our brains have adapted with this amazing thing called daydreaming. Daydreaming is such a gift, right? You can be in the middle of a terrible situation. You daydream, you're on the beach in Maui, all of a sudden you're gone. Right? You're there, but you're gone in your head, right? So people have adapted to the noise. So when you talk about what you do, if people don't find it relevant or helpful or clear, they're just like, this is just too much work to think about what this person is saying, and they daydream. And so that's one of the way, reasons why it's difficult to get people's attention, because it turns out that everybody is trying to get their attention. That coveted little space, those few inches, square inches on people's phones, we have people spending millions of dollars and time right now thinking about how to get people's attention. And as a result, we've coped by tuning it out. But there's this other thing that's causing the problem, and that's called the curse of knowledge. It's not a term that I invented. A guy named Lee Lefevre, he wrote a book called The Art of Explanation, which I highly recommend. But in this, he talks about the curse of knowledge as a thing that people suffer with when you're good at what you do. So I'm thinking that if you've spent any kind of time, some people years, you've done your education in your field, you've met with clients, you're probably very successful. Uh, the blogs you read, the articles that you consume, the peers that you interact with on a daily basis are probably also very good at what they do. And so you're just surrounded with your, your own little world. And when you try to talk about that world with other people, they have no idea what you're talking about. Because you're thinking and talking at a nine or a 10 out of a, a maximum 10. And then you get someone who's, who's new to this world that you could really help, but you're talking to them in such a high level that they're like, I don't understand what this person's talking about. And remember what I said, if, if what somebody is saying to you isn't clear, they tune it out right away. I don't know if you've ever hung out with nurses and doctors. I did for a while and it was awful. I mean, yeah, if you had an issue, you could say, hey, why is my arm turning green here? Can you help me out here? And hanging out with doctors is good that way. But socially, you get doctors talking together, or nurses talking together. They're talking about code blues and code reds and an IP3 and an XORT. And I had on, the, on floor three with an RTZ. And you're just like, I have no idea. It's so confusing. What are they doing? They're talking insider language. And they think everybody should know what these codes mean and what these acronyms mean. But the truth is, we the public, we don't. We have no clue. And we do that all the time in our industry. The curse of knowledge is basically when you think everybody should know this. This is common language. So we think and talk at a nine or a 10. And you're like, well, I should probably bring it down to a seven, you know, on my website or during my elevator pitch. But the truth is that's still evidence of the curse of knowledge because 
that's still way too high. Most of us make our buying decisions at a two or a three, at a very emotional level. And so that's one of the reasons why it's tough to get people's attention because they're tuning us out because we're just confusing them with our words. We do it out of our mouths and we do it on our websites and our email campaigns and on our social media as well. And thirdly, this is one of the reasons why we're getting tuned out, why it's so hard to get attention is because we just talk about ourselves too much. And I totally get it because I am a public enemy number one for this. Friends and family watched me during my dating years, my 20s. They watched the debacle that was my dating experience, like one watches an auto accident or something, right? Some sort of, some sort of satisfaction they got from watching me go through failed relationship after failed relationship. And I love telling this story because every time I do, people are like pointing at other people or they say, that's me. We have a time of confession afterwards. But listen to my dating strategy and you tell me if you can figure out what was wrong with it. Meet a girl and try to impress her as quickly as possible with stories of exotic travel, uh, celebrities that I had selfies with, uh, high school sporting accomplishments that I was uh, particularly proud of, and, uh, and basically things that I wanted to do, maybe a car that I wanted to buy one day or something inspiring that inspired me that I thought, of course she'll be totally interested in. And after a couple of dates, couldn't figure out why she wasn't interested anymore. Who wouldn't want to hear more stories about me? <laughs> and so on and on I went through failed relationship after failed relationship until I got to my 30s and my friend introduced me to this one gal, said, John, You've been in a lot of relationships, but I believe in you. I think there's still hope for people like you. Uh, you know, we need to populate this world. And I think this girl is great. She's smart. She's good looking. And I think you guys would get along well together. Just don't screw this one up, okay? And so he introduced me to her. And I was like, okay, I'm 30 now. I got to take a new perspective. Got to be, a, you know, start a family one day. Want to make this one work. So I did something completely counterintuitive. And I started talking to her, asking questions and ending my sentences with question marks instead of periods and exclamation marks. And in doing so, I learned a whole bunch of cool stuff. I learned you know, what she was interested in. I learned about why she chose the, the career path that she did. Learned about why she was so interested in her family, the places she wanted to travel, the experiences she wanted to have, things that she valued in life. And on and on we go. We ran out of time every single date, so we needed to get another one, and another one, another one, and on and on it went. And sure enough, I would go home and make a list, and of all the different things we talked about, I know it's a little weird, um, especially when I got to like, what's her favorite food? And I would write lasagna. And then I was like, I don't know why she'd pick lasagna. So I said, why do you like lasagna? She said, well, I like the, I like the meat to cheese to noodle ratio. I thought, and then I learned that was a bit too far. I almost lost it there. She's like, this guy's a bit borderline creepy, but he's interesting because he's interested in me. So I, I, after a few months, I looked, and I was like, the places she wants to go, the kind of family she wants to have, the experiences, I, I want those too. If I can help her achieve this, we could make a life here. We could build something because we both want to go there. And what a difference it made, taking an actual interest in her and not just talking about myself all the time. A few months later, put a ring on it. A few years later, uh, we were, were married and have three beautiful children. I realized that marriage is uh, not for me. It's for her. And that's what business is about as well. So you think of my story, think, man, what a, what a disaster you are. You must have been in your 20s. You must have been terrible. Narcissist, talking about yourself all the time. I say, yeah, you know what? I, I was. I confess that. But you know what? When I tell that story, I realize we're all kind of doing the same. We love talking about ourselves. There is a natural human inclination to say, I want to just talk about me and all the things I can do and share my story. You know, people hear that I'm the story guy and that they can come to me because it's like, hey, you're the story guy we're going to pay you some money to tell our story. I said, I don't want your money because nobody cares about your story. It's like, well, we, we climbed the mountain. We had a board meeting. We, we know our why. We want to talk about our why. And I'm like, well, guess what? Nobody else wants to hear about your why. Nobody wants, nobody really cares. I mean, yeah, your, your mom cares about your why and your spouse pretends to care about your why, but the rest of us, the people that you want to reach with your product, your service, your, your offering, we're so busy with our lives. You start talking about your why, all we hear is just more noise. So we talk about ourselves way too much. And I think it's okay to start with why, but eventually some point you gotta transition and start then again with who. And that's what my uh, company is all about. We basically take that, uh, that practice that I learned during uh, my dating experience that then led to, by the grace of God, my marriage experience, of actually taking an interest in the people that you want to help, the people you want to reach. And we create marketing collateral that helps people actually reach the very people they want. And it turns out it's completely counterintuitive to what most of us humans 
have bought into the fact that we have to talk about ourselves as much as possible. When the truth is, we need to get into the head and the heart of the very people we're trying to reach. And that is how you get dating, marriage, to a happy life. But it's also how you grow a business and how you market in a noisy world. I want to say, too, that uh, before we move on, this is an interactive time, right? I, I'm, I'm talking a lot about how I shouldn't be talking so much. So my job is to help you guys however I can. So do feel free if you want to jump in uh, and, and ask a question. I'm happy to, to pause. But I want to share with you my big idea. that The best way to get someone's attention in this noisy world is to show them how you can help them win their story. This worked for my relationship with my, who is now my wife. And it works in businesses that want to grow by reaching their ideal client. So there's four principles that I believe in capturing attention. Yes, sir. Well, that's what we're going to get to. We're going to, I'm going to teach you how to help people see that you're the best solution to win their story. So there's four principles you need to know, and then we'll wrap it up to show exactly how it, how it happens. So here's, um, Here's a principle, number one. Everyone has a dream that gets them out of bed every day. Everyone has a dream that gets them out of bed every day. I read a book that completely reshaped my view of how to do effective marketing. In fact, it's driven a lot of the, the values and the way I, I do my business, the way I help my clients. It's a book called Building a Story Brand by a, book, uh, by a guy named Donald Miller. And in this book, he basically says that every single person wakes up as the main character in a story. It's their story, and that's the story, it turns out, that they only care about. I mean, yeah, there's other people, other characters involved in their story. There's uh, clients and coworkers and, and a spouse and a kid or a partner or some kind of person. They're supporting cast, but they are the main character in their story, and their goal is to win their story. They wake up every single day saying, how can I achieve the happily ever after of which my heart desires? Right? They want to win their story, just like all of you want to win your story, you want to come out on top, whatever that looks like. You want to get the girl, you want to get the guy, you want to grow your business, you want to sell your business, you want to, you want to become smart, you want to be uh, seen as the kind of person uh, that you always uh, aspire to be. And so we all wake up every single day uh, with a desire, and that, and that actually fuels the kind of resources we consume. Uh, it, it, it even affects our diet, it affects the jobs, the career paths that we take, it affects the blogs that we read or the social media posts that we consume, uh, the, the events even after hours that we attend, the networking events are all part of helping us become the kind of people that we want to be. And Facebook actually knows this and uh, Google understands this because they know that the only thing that you're really interested in are things that interest you. You see, remember in the old days when uh, the there was no real uh, sophisticated algorithm for Facebook. Just everybody was just posting whatever, like their food uh, and their kids and uh, you know, an article or some politics, some spirituality, anything. I mean, that, that thing was just a dog's breakfast of information from your friends, right? And then all of a sudden, uh, Facebook user enjoyment started to dip and they said, uh oh, if people aren't enjoying being on our app, we better change what's on our app so that we give people what they want. And so that Facebook started to listen. Uh, same, Google does the same, YouTube will do the same. And we, they just fill the algorithm with things that they know interest you. Otherwise, your enjoyment will go down and then you'll find some other uh, app to consume. And they don't want that. They want you eyes on the app. So they're always listening. In fact, they're probably listening right now. Right? You've been in a lunch meeting where somebody said some sort of product and then all of a sudden you opened up Facebook app and there was an Amazon ad for it right there. I once floated this idea at a dinner party and I said, you know, I think our phones are actually listening to us. And you know what happened? Everybody laughed at me. And then Siri laughed at me. And then Alexa laughed at me. <laughs> and then their Google Home all laughed at me. But that, there's on, they're on to something. That the ones who have time and, and resources to spend time with marketing says that people are only interested in things that are going to help them win their story because they are the main character in a story and all they want to do is win. And everything else, we've learned to tune out. So they may have a dream that's getting them out of bed, but they also have a problem that's keeping them up at night. Because in this broken world, there are things that are, are getting in our way of us achieving our dreams. There's skills we don't have. There's forces that are working against us. There's 
information that we, we don't have that we need. There's technology that we don't have access to that our lives would benefit from. And as a result, it's keeping us up at night. It's causing us stress, anxiety, uh, frustration. And that is, we, like, we just want to get rid of them, right? We want to solve that kind of, there's some sort of problem and we need to solve it. And it turns out that that is the thing that people pay attention to the most. If you can agitate a problem that somebody is facing, whether it's they're not getting enough business, they're not uh, getting enough leads, uh, they have trouble internally with their company, uh, their health is in jeopardy, their, their race, relationships are a mess. In this broken world, we've all got tons of problems. And that turns out that there's a market for that. And that's where entrepreneurs come and they want to seize those problems. But first, they have to be able to talk about them in a way that's clear, that gets people's attention, saying, that's my problem. If you can talk about somebody's problem even better than they can articulate it themselves, you'll be an instant star with them. You'll have lots of trust because this person must understand me. And so we need to realize that everybody has a problem that's keeping up, them up at night. Your ideal client, your ideal customer has a problem that's keeping them up at night. And you've got to figure out a way to talk about it in such a way they say, my goodness, that's exactly what I was wrestling with all night last night. I didn't sleep a wink or I was up stressing about it or I've been thinking about it all day. And as a result, you wrote a blog or you made a video or you did a course or you have something out there. I heard your elevator pitch. That's exactly what I need because it's been bugging me all day and it's keeping me from winning my story. That's how you get people's attention, right? The third principle is this. We are all looking for a guide to help us, not another hero. We're all looking for a guide to help us and not another hero. Again, back to that book, Building a Story Brand. I think this is a very uh, powerful moment in the book when, when Don Miller basically says, uh, the reason why your marketing, the reason why your website isn't converting, the reason why people are tuning, tuning you out or just thinking that you're adding more noise to an already noisy world is because you're so busy playing the hero of a story. And in a world of limited time and resources, people don't need to meet any more heroes. What they're looking for is a guide to help them, the hero, win the day. Let me, sh let me share a little bit about uh, how cool this is. Because you know instinctively, and I'm going to wreck every movie for you for the rest of your life, uh, by the way, just as a means of caveat. So someone like a Luke Skywalker, right? Luke is, is uh, full of um, energy, full of excitement, and he has this problem. He doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know how to use the force. He knows he's special, but he doesn't know how to use all this power that he has. So what's he going to do? Is he going to just, you know, take a, a class on how to use the force? No, they didn't have classes. Uh, is he going to uh, read a book? No, didn't have uh, books for him. He needs a guide. He needs somebody to help him. So he meets Yoda. Not baby Yoda. This was before then, right? He meets Yoda, who understands the force and knows Luke's story. He also needs Obi-Wan Kenobi, another guide character that screenwriters put in there to help the main character, the protagonist, win the story. So... Luke can eventually fly his little flyer into that big cat butt, the Death Star, uh, and, and, and find his way to win, to win the day. And at the end, he knows who he is. He knows how to use his Jedi powers, and he wins. Uh, more examples. Katniss Everton from, uh, from The Hunger Games, right? She uh, is put into these games and, and thrust in. She's got some natural ability. She's able to win the first round, right? But at the end of the day, there's, she realizes there's a much bigger tournament going on here and much bigger uh, powers that are overwhelming to her. She needs to find somebody who's going to help her. She finds or this character named Hamish. And Hamish has actually won the games. And you better believe that Hamish is very uh, appealing to Katniss because she needs help to win the Hunger Games, to be reunited with her family, and to overthrow the tyranny of the capital. There's a guy named Frodo as well. Frodo you may know from, the hung uh, sorry, from Lord of the Rings. Right? Frodo has this burden of carrying these rings. He needs to get them to Mordor. And there's temptations along the way, and there's a burden that he bears, and he doesn't even know the way to get there. Frodo is completely lost on his own, and he will not win if left to his own self against all the orcs and all the, you know, Gollum and everything. He needs a guide character, and that's why J.R. Tolkien put in Gandalf in there. And Gandalf is the white wizard who knows the way to Mordor, who understands the frustrations and the struggles that Frodo is going to face. And then there's Happy Gilmore, uh, golf classic uh, filmed here in, on the west coast of Vancouver at the uh, Capilano Country Club, you know, on the North Shore there. Uh, Happy Gilmore is, uh, is a guy who has a grandma who's in financial trouble. And Happy sees that golfers win these big checks, but Happy is a struggling hockey player. 
right? So he's not doing well uh, earning big checks. He sees golfers do it and he's like, I want that big check so I can save my grandma. That's the winning the story. But here's Happy's problem. Happy has never played golf before and, uh, and he's no good at it. He takes his drives like slap shots. So left to his own vices, Happy will be stuck. He'll never win big checks because he'll never win golf tournaments. He'll be no good. Happy needs some help. Happy meets a guy named Chubbs. Chubbs is a pro golfer. He's a pro golf teacher. He lost his uh, fingers uh, because of an alligator accident. Uh, so he can't golf himself anymore, but he knows how to help people win in golf. So uh, Happy hires Chubbs and Chubbs helps him win golf and get the big check so he can save his grandma. In all of these examples, you'll notice there was a main character and then there was a guide character who helped the main character win. Now, what would happen if two main characters met each other in a, in a confrontation, right? Imagine uh, Katniss is in the middle of the woods, in the, in the middle of a Hunger Games tournament, and all of a sudden she hears some rustling in the bushes. All of a sudden she draws her bow, because that's what instinctively she'll do. She needs to shoot at any threat that's coming. And out pops this tiny little hobbit with a staff. And she looks, she says, I don't, I don't recognize you. Like, who are you? She says, well, I'm Frodo. It's like, Katniss says, Frodo, what are you doing here? He goes, well, I'm on my way to Mordor. I need to discard of these rings here to save Middle Earth. And then she looks, it's like, okay. And Frodo looks and says, well, who are you? And why are you pointing a bow at me? He goes, well, I'm Katniss. I'm, I, I have to win the Hunger Games. I have to destroy, I have to be the last person standing or else, or else I'll be dead. And Frodo looks and says, well, I'm not trying to kill you. And she's looked at him and said, well, I'm not trying to get in your way to Mordor. And off they go. Two, two heroes of stories met each other and passed on their way. Now, what happens if Katniss hears another rough, rough rustling in the bushes and out pops Hamish? And she's got, you know, ready to shoot. And then she realizes, wait, this is Hamish. He's won the Hunger Games before. He's acting like my friend. He's speaking in a way that I understand. He can help me. And all of a sudden she's like, hey, Hamish, can you help me? Can you teach me how to win these games? Can you show me what to do? Because I'm interested and I'm excited and I need to learn what you know. Will you be my guide? And, and off they go. You better believe that uh, Katniss is hanging off every single word that Hamish says. Why? Because Hamish is going to help her win her story. And then Frodo goes on his way, and he hears a rustling in the bushes, and out pops Gandalf. There's the white wizard, the one who knows the way to Mordor, the one who understands the frustrations and the temptations that Frodo will face, and the one that can help him get where he wants to go. You better believe that Frodo is going to be hanging on every single word that Gandalf shares with him. Why? Because he's the guide that's going to help Frodo win his story, to get the rings to Mordor, to destroy Sauron, to save Middle-earth, and restore peace in the Shire. In the first example I gave, Katniss met Frodo, and two heroes of a story were going different ways. They had nothing in common, and they just kind of passed by. In the second example, a hero met a guide, and the hero was glued to the guide and attentive to the guide and excited for everything the guide was going to say. One of the reasons, uh, so says Donald Miller in Building a Story Brand, that our marketing isn't connecting is because we're playing the hero when we should be playing the guide. And in a world of limited time and resources, people don't have time to talk to other heroes. They want to talk to a guide. So when you're at a networking event and you talk about how exciting your business is and your third quarter growth and how you're bringing on new people and you're excited for what's happening, all people hear is the same thing Charlie Brown's teacher was, would say. Wah, 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 wah. And they'll shake your hand and they'll look like they're all excited and then they'll pass you by and say, that seems really interesting. You seem like a very significant person. You're clearly the hero of a story, but if you'll just excuse me right now, I'm really needing a guide and I need some help winning my story. So that's the third principle. We are looking for a guide to help us and not another hero. Fourthly, Winning businesses sees market opportunities to help people win. See, when you hear stuff like this, this is where entrepreneurs start to get excited, right? Because they think, I know some people that have a problem and I know the solution to it. And this is where you've come up with some sort of idea, some sort of widget, some piece of technology, whatever it is that you do. And you realize that you can help people. And if you can pitch it in such a way that you show them that it's not about you, it's actually about them. And they'll say, you are the kind of person that I need because I'm a character in a story who's in a, a part of transformation. Notice in our favorite stories, the character as they start are never the same as they, as they end. There's always a transformation. 
And so we need to be able to talk about that transformation in a way that gets people excited about what we're offering them. So this is where we can seize market opportunities and realize that most of our competitors are just talking about themselves. Right? They're talking about how good they are, how exciting it is to do business with them, the features that they offer. And you're going to be different now because instead of just talking about yourself, you're going to dial into the psychology of what's driving my ideal client. What is waking them up every single morning? What is it they want? Because I'm going to fill what I talk about and I'm going to fill my website with pictures of them winning their story. And then I'm going to earn their trust because I'm going to talk about the problem that's keeping them up at night. Too many people are frustrated with, about this but we're gonna offer you some benefits that are gonna help you. We're gonna not talk about our features, we're gonna talk about our benefits. We're gonna switch all that hero language into guide language of how we're gonna take you from where you are to where you wanna go. We're gonna be the guy that's gonna help you. I believe business, like all of business, is built on this whole system, that a consumer is the hero of a story with a problem that's keeping them up at night, and we come along as guides, and we're able to help them win their story. So how can you get your business the attention it deserves? I want to talk about uh, three things that we can do that you can do right away. The first one is this, get clear on your ideal customer or your ideal client, get clear on their story, right? So work through, uh, in, in the story brand world, we call this a brand script. Okay, so if you read the book, one of the, the calls to action is to create a brand script. Uh, that's one of the things that I do with, uh, with clients is, is walk through, okay, who's your ideal client? Like, let's talk about their demographics. Where do they live? How old are they? Uh, what language do they speak? What are they uh, into? What do they need to win their story that you can help them? And then we look at their problem and say, what is it that uh, they're struggling with, both uh, externally in the, uh, what, what can we see and, and touch and what's obvious to the naked eye, but also what's it doing to them internally? And then how do we position your company as the trusted guide? So how do we create statements of empathy that they say, man, you get me. And how do we create statements of authority where they say, I can, trust, I can trust you. This isn't your first rodeo. You clearly help people like me all the time. We talk about what's the clearest call to action that you could have. Right? So, so you draw a line in the sand and, you, and like every story, right? The guide never ends up winning the story for the hero. The hero has to make the decision in the end and take the call to action. Every business has that same drama carry out where you can't just go and do it for them. You've got to have them click that button sign up for that course, whatever it may, may be, you gotta have a very clear call to action. And so we make sure we get that in the customer's uh, story. And lastly, one of the things I love talking about is just, are you able to cast a vision with your words? When you're looking at somebody uh, eyeball to eyeball and you're able to say, hey, you know, this is how you feel now, but imagine how great it's gonna feel when, when this happens. And you just talk a little bit because you've spent time walking in their shoes and thinking about what it's like to win their story. Right, when the curtains draw and happily ever after it goes. If you get good at talking about that, man, you could win people over so, so well. Just using those words, imagine how great it would feel. Uh, one, of my, one of my niches that I love helping is chiropractors. I kind of stumbled into it. I didn't uh, go from the get-go, but I just seemed to help chiropractors. And I, I know them now. And, and one of the things that I like to say to them is, look, every time a patient walks into your office, you have the opportunity to to show them how you're gonna help them win their story. And they say, well, what does that mean? I say, look, they, they don't, they're not coming to you because they're feeling great. Something's bothering them. They're back, uh, you know, it's a, maybe it's a sports injury, they're feeling left out because they can't hang out with their friends on the weekend anymore, they can't play with kids on the floor. And you have an opportunity to cast vision for them. Say, hey, this is how you feel now, but imagine how great it's gonna feel when you're back on your bike, hanging out with your buddies again. And imagine how great it's going to feel to hang out with your grandkids on the floor. And you're not going to be thinking about pain. You're going to be thinking about how much fun you're having. Imagine how great it's going to feel to be at work again and feel like you're contributing to society and not feeling like you're a detriment to your family just sitting on the couch in agony all the time. You know? and, and all of a sudden, they light up and they say, I could do that. I could do that every single time. And that's what you can do. You, you think about their story and what's the outcome that they're hoping for. And it's your job to cast vision about what it could be you know, what is it in your, in your industry with your ideal client? What is that happily ever after that they're looking for? You better get good at talking about it and put it on your website and, and talk about it in your videos and in your talks and your sales meetings because that's what they need to hear, that you're the type of person who delivers happily ever after for them. And that's part of what we, uh, we call brand messaging. Right? So I would encourage you to have a brand messaging guide. So 
create an elevator pitch, right? So even though I do this professionally, I get it. I still get nervous every time it's my turn to talk at a networking event or a BNI group or just when somebody asks, what do you do on an airplane? I still get nervous and I do it for a living. But if I had a script, if you have a script where it's just like, this is what I'm going to say. This is the problem I solve. This is how we solve it. This is the outcome we provide. You answer those three questions and you memorize it. You could get your whole team singing off the same song sheet. I imagine if you are a farmer and you're, I know it's, we're in an urban area, so it's kind of difficult, but I live in the Fraser Valley. It's not as difficult of a sell to, sh to share this story. But if you got some cattle and you want to brand it with the family brand, what do you do, right? You take the big, let's say Morrison M and you go, Psh, and you brand it and the cow goes, right? And then somebody else is like, hey, I want to brand that thing too. So they take their uh, brand and they go, Psh, and they put uh, something in it. And then another company or another person goes, Psh, and all of a sudden, this cow is like over and over branded. I mean, this is a terrible illustration if you're a cow. But you get the idea if you're trying to market your business. Because what's happening is your employees or other people are talking about what you do to other people in sales calls or on the phone or if they're your web designer or copywriter or whatever they're doing. They're all talking about you in a certain way. You need to be able to control that. And one of the best ways to do it is to write out your one-liner or your elevator pitch. You know, your one-liner could be your email signature, could be something you put on the board, could be your, the banner of your, of your website. But think about that. What is, the, what is our one-liner? And it's, it's part of your brand messaging. So I know that there's, there's a lot of people in town that charge a lot of money to come up with your, your fonts and your three colors and your logo and the impression that it gives and all that. But I think even more important than your, your brand look is your brand message because words are compelling. You can have a beautiful website with three nice colors and nice fonts, but anybody can get that for $15 on Squarespace these days, right? A brand message is actually the words that, that are on your website, the words that you're using in a sales call. Words are powerful, words compel, and you need to have a brand message if you don't already. And thirdly, once you have these things, you're clear on the story, you've developed your, 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 your messaging, then just start applying it. If you have brochures, take a look. Are they hero centric? Like we're the hero or are they, uh, are they guide? Like, do they position us as a guide? Uh, are they, is, is your website reflecting of that? Is, you know, you could go, just go through everything you're doing and just say, is this me centered or is this customer centered? And I believe uh, that, that once you do these three things, you'll have clarity and you'll have a, a, a certain sta standout-ishness <laughs> that will separate you from your competition so that when you talk, people will pay attention because you'll be speaking to the very problem that was keeping them up at night and the very dream that they had uh, ever since they were a kid. That, I believe, is how you stand out. Um, my company is called Get Clear Consulting. We're based here in Metro Vancouver. We serve clients all around the world, uh, but we're more than happy to, um, to, to meet with you guys. Uh, there's a website. We have a website, getclear.ca. And if you go to getclear.ca slash bonus, I've got a whole bunch of resources for you guys. I'm going to give you a little hint. Uh, one of them is an email opt-in. So you come in my funnel, you never get out, brother or sister. <laughs> but most of them are just free. Like you literally just hit them download and they'll come. We're going to talk about how to apply this to your website. Talk about what are the essentials of a winning website. Uh, there's, a, there's a few resources on even just the first three chapters of building a story brand. I've got that for you with no email opt-in. So if you're interested in this kind of material, there's lots for you uh, to learn about. And I'm more than happy to be a part of it because one of those things is a 30-minute call uh, with me where we can just talk about some of the things and uh, a debrief on some of the things you learned uh, today. And I'm more than happy to do that to kind of get into the head and heart of your ideal client rather than just talking about you all the time. So thanks so much uh, for your time. My goal really is to just help you uh, meet people that you need to meet with the products that you've designed that can really change their lives. And I, I just have a utopian vision of business that businesses exist to help real people with real solutions to real problems but the problem is in this noisy world, it's difficult. And it's especially difficult when all we want to do is talk about ourselves. Thanks so much for your time. Questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Great question. Um, 
I would say be generous as a, as, oh yes, so the question was, uh, do, is it better to have uh, an email opt-in where you get their email address and you get it for life, or just to give away free content like a blog or something, right? Or just a checklist or, or something that you can use. Uh, I would say as a, as a brand owner, it's good to have both. I wanna have free stuff because then I can say, hey, this is totally free, no strings attached. But at the other time, I also want to be able to, to know who's consuming my stuff so I can continue to give them more. Uh, the, the currency of someone's email address is about $20, I think. You know, Craig, you could debate, we could debate that. But uh, if, if I give you my email address, that's the equivalent of me giving you $20. Because I know what's gonna happen, right? You're gonna start hitting me with your stuff. But if your stuff is good, then I'm gonna continue to, to keep it. My wife gets nailed with Gap uh, ads all the time. Like, I think, and I'm like, why do you put up with this on your phone? Like, they send her something every single day, some sort of email. But every once in a while, like one, once a month, she'll say, we've got to go to Gap today. They have a 70% off sale, which is more than the 65% they had the week before and the 60 they had the week before that. At some point, we hit a breaking point and we need to go to the Gap. And all of a sudden, we're all going to Gap and we're all spending money on, on this big sale. And for some reason, she doesn't opt out and she doesn't unsubscribe. The reason why she stays in is because uh, of every once in a while. So people might not read your emails. In fact, they might only read one out of 10, but they'll stay on your email list because that one out of 10 was very valuable for them. So if you don't, if you don't get their email address, you can't keep that communication going. Uh, however, you wanna be seen as a generous brand. I think we have to be more generous uh, as, a, as a core value in our businesses and just give stuff away. And that's people, and what that does is it builds trust, right? So I would say do both. Oh, uh, getclear.ca slash uh, bonus. So yeah, this will be our, um, our consulting page. The website one that we talked about was getclearsites.com. Uh, because I'm in messaging, I have to be very careful not to confuse people. So uh, this is, would be just for the messaging side of, of our business. But it's got all the freebies on uh, slash bonus for you, including those, those first three chapters, which is, to me is, is, is extremely valuable. If you've enjoyed uh, my take of Donald Miller's uh, stuff, you're gonna love it from him himself. And because uh, and, the framework is so powerful. People see it and they just, they fall in love with it. They're like, this is what I've been, I've, I've missed out on this my whole life. You know, I've been talking about myself. That's why no one's listening anymore. They've tuned us out. I'm just more noise, just like everyone else talking about themselves. I wanna be different. I wanna be a guide instead of the hero. So I encourage you to read that book. John. Thank you, Roger. You have been a great way to start the year. Oh, good. That's great to hear. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Whoa. Clicker. Clicker. Now that I've thanked John, I also want to thank uh, Envision Coworking. You have made this uh, uh, recording possible. The world, starting tomorrow, will benefit from John's wisdom. Thank you to both. And thank you, VBN members and guests, for giving of your time and your trust to be here tonight and sharing our first meetup of 2020 in this wonderful new space filled with beautiful people about to enjoy 48 consecutive beautiful speakers. Good night and thank you. <laughs>